dedicated to empowering you with information to make positive choices and be advocates for your overall well-being. Welcome to The Health View. Welcome to The Health View. I'm Yvonne Dunitz, and our topic today is about the neuroscience of the brain and the impact of love. My guest is Dr. Christopher Cook. He is the author of the book, The Compassionate Achiever, How Helping Others Fuels Success, a four-step program for cultivating compassion. New research in biology, neuroscience, and economics has found that compassion, recognizing a problem or caring about another's pain and making a commitment to help, not only improves others' lives, it can transform our own. Based on the most recent studies from a wide range of fields, the compassionate achiever reveals the profound benefits of practicing compassion, including more constructive relationships, improved intelligence, and increased resiliency. Dr. Cook is a professor of political science and social science at Western Connecticut State University. He is the founding director of the Center for Compassion, Creativity, and Innovation, and faculty advisor for the University and City of Compassion Initiatives. He is also co-founder and CEO of Innov Owl LLC, a research and consulting startup for solving micro and macro problems through innovative education. He was an international security fellow at Harvard University's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, a counterintelligent agent for the United States Army, and a research associate for Cambridge Energy Research Associates. Join me in welcoming Dr. Cook. Welcome, Dr. Cook. We're excited to have you here with us today to talk about the significant research and things that you've learned regarding the neuroscience of the brain. A lot of people don't even know what the neuroscience of the brain is. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, it's really important, not just for you know school kids in terms of learning, but for all of us in terms of our everyday interactions with one another, both at home and at work. So What's really cool about neuroscience lately and functional MRI machines is that we're learning how what we think and how we see life actually impacts on not only how we interact with one another, but literally in how we see reality. And so latest neuroscience has been showing us, for example, that when we think empathetically compared to when we think compassionately, which are two different ways neuroscience has shown us that we actually... Um, are seeing the world differently and then experiencing the world differently. Just as an example, when we think empathetically, neuroscience has shown us that we use the neural networks of when we're in pain. And so we release like neurotransmitters like cortisol, which actually stresses, you know, it's a stress hormone, which actually clouds our reality. But when we think compassionately, we actually use different neural networks. And Dr. Tanya Singer from Leipzig, Germany came, was the first to show this that we use the networks, when we're thinking compassionately, of when we're in love. And we release different neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin, which give us the high reward level and that clarity in reality. So literally, neuroscience is showing us how our everyday interactions are first start inside of us and how we see the world. And that world is framed by how we think. And neuroscience is showing us the neurotransmitters, for example, that are actually affecting both of those ends. So related to the neurotransmitters, what would they be? How is it affecting the entire human body? Yeah, that's a great question. So let's go to something that uh, a peptide hormone. So when we think compassionately, for example, uh, we release a peptide hormone called oxytocin, not oxycotton, right? It's oxytocin. And oxytocin, a lot of um, nursing mothers automatically emit oxytocin. And they call it the uh, cuddle hormone, the love molecule, uh, for example, because it then activates in our brain dopamine and serotonin. And dopamine 
gives us that high reward. We feel happy. We feel optimistic, hopeful. Literally, our whole body is is sending through to, because the neurotransmitter is sending through our body this this type of hopefulness that makes us achieve greater success. And so, literally, it's by one step of thinking we affect our entire body in terms of what we can do or what we can't do. And so that's just one simple way of, of how, how it goes. But I got to say something before we move on. It's dopamine and serotonin because if it's just dopamine, that's addiction. Dopamine and serotonin. Serotonin is another neurotransmitter that comes out of oxytocin. And that is a calming, has a calming uh, sense about our entire body. So we have this happy, optimistic, hopeful calmness about us when we, re when we release in combination dopamine and serotonin. It's really pretty cool. It is, and it has an amazing sense of helping us, I think, to stay healthy, healthy and well, related to our whole well-being. It does, and, and I think what you just brought up with, to be honest with you, Yvonne, is a really key aspect for both teachers, students, and I would argue parents, being a, a father of three boys, you know, avoiding burnout is pretty pretty important, right? But even at work. And so when you think empathetically, you're using the same neural networks of when you're in pain. So no matter where you're at, at work, at home, you're actually burning out easier through empathy. It's really empathy fatigue. There's no such thing as compassion fatigue, as we now know through neuroscience. And that was one of the new kind of findings that we, what we have over the last, you know, about 10 years or so, was that compassion fatigue was brought, thought to have occurred in the 1980s and the nursing literature first brought that up. But now, because of neuroscience, you're beginning question, Yvonne, we now know it's really empathy fatigue because when you use the neural networks of love, when you're in love, Yvonne, like I, I'm very fortunate. I married my high school sweetheart. We've been married over 30 years. Man, it doesn't burn out. It just burns. It keeps burning. It's like this nuclear reactor that just keeps going on. And and, and that there's no burnout to it. And, and so we, we've learned now how to avoid that, that burnout cause, right? By not thinking empathetically, but thinking more compassionately. And when we think about young people, little ones, starting from babies going all the way through the lifespan, this is important information to realize because it can impact their ability to learn, to survive, and to succeed. Yes, yes. And yeah, that, that's really important. And this idea, for example, of the little ones, the need for interaction with others. We know that that's a really key element. There's been several neuroscience books. One this year, Wall Street Journal just reviewed one. Um, literally, I have the review right in front of me. It's called Mind in Motion. And then there was another one last year um, that shows you that your environment, Yvonne, and the people you hang with. In other words, grandma was right. The people you hang with determine what it affects you and affects literally your mind. It affects your brain because they either help you release neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin, or they help you release cortisol, the stress hormone, right, which you don't want. And so your environment, your interactions with others are really a key ingredient. What happens outside of you affects inside, and what inside affects outside. It's a constant dance. And to have that young to have the young people interact with others and to learn that awareness and relationship between each other is a real learning skill, not just that is key for the classroom, but key, I think you would, we could all say for work. So what would you recommend that people do bringing in this awareness in their actions, in their communication with others, and how they encourage to bring out the best in each other? Yeah, I, I, I have my book, uh, The Compassion Achiever, and that's what it really gets to. It gets to how we can all collaborate, cooperate, <laughs> and coordinate with each other to move society in a much more constructive way. We know through uh, evolutionary theory, for example, Charles Darwin and others, has shown the reason why human society has actually reached the apex in terms of nature is not because we were ruthless or callous or looking out for number one. It's that literally we cooperated with each other, right? And so yeah. that's a really key aspect. And so my book was about, well, how do we do this on an everyday level, on an individual level? Right? And so I have this basic four-step process I call LUCA, L-U-C-A. And L stands for listen to learn. 
And that's the really key aspect. We, we live in a society that listens to reply, right? And we don't sit back and listen to really learn what, and listen and hear what someone's saying. We, we think we should respond by or re reply quickly with an, an answer to something we may disagree with. When in essence, sometimes we're really saying the same thing, but we're saying it differently or attaching or approaching a, a problem differently. So I think the first thing we need to do is listen. <laughs> Just take the time. When, when I'm in class, for example, with my students, and I ask a question, one of the things I do just to help me shut up is I do this. And it, just as I go, shh, Chris, <laughs> you know, be quiet. Let the students and listen to what the students are saying. And, and believe it or not, their insights are much more profound than I think we give credit to because sometimes we try to cut them off. So listen to learn. So it's, it's even more yeah. than just listen to learn, isn't it? It's listen to learn and understand. That's the second part, right? It's understand to know how someone sees a problem. So the first part is listen to learn. The second part, the you, and Luca, you're right, is understand to know. Understand to know what you need to do in the, in the future to help them, but you need the understanding of how they see a problem because their perspective could be different than yours because we all, we all experience life differently. And that literally changes, and neuroscience has shown this, our synaptic pathways. So we each have a different synaptic pathways in our brain because of our experiences. The reason I bring this up is that we can learn, understand each other right, from those different experiences. So there's always something to learn from somebody else. right? It's never just a throwaway. So listen to learn, understand to know, and then connect to capabilities. Sometimes the the way to solve a problem is literally within us by maybe taking a different role. So I'll just use me for example. Not only am I at school, I'm not only am I a professor, but I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a runner, right? I'm a former counterintelligence agent, right? We have a lot of different identities in us. And sometimes when we're in a one role, like say a parent role, if maybe we take our CIA role, right? We might be able to find a different solution to it. That's one way to connect. But another way is to understand that there are people maybe right around you that are better equipped to handle that problem. So you want to connect that person to somebody who has a better capability than you. And that gets to the final one, A, act to solve. Just don't sit there, right? Get out there and do something. I sound like a Nike commercial. But basically, right, it's getting out there and acting. And we don't have enough people who do that. We have people who complain or politicians who say, I feel your pain. That's empathy. Compassion is, I want you to do something about it, right? And I think we need more people in our society that actually act to solve. So Luca, listen, understand, connect, and act. And how can we utilize this in the classroom? Oh my gosh, so many different ways. One, I have a real problem with teaching to the test. Because in neuroscience, we know if you teach to the test, Students don't learn it. We have studies recently that have actually shown that if you teach to the test and you give the same test six months later, every student fails. But students who actually learn the material, and there's a bunch of different ways you can learn their material. So in the classroom, for example, Yvonne, to take Luca and put it in there, is having all students, not just your top students, but all students teach to the other students various aspects of whatever they need to learn. It sets in like concrete, and it, it doesn't matter when you give the test, they all pass. And you know, there's a book by uh, Matthew Lieberman called Social that actually shows this time and time again. And other neuroscientists, he's a um, social psycho uh, cognitive neuroscientist. And there are plenty of other studies out there that show that when you actively engage, when you listen, when you get them to connect, when you get them to act, like teaching, they actually learn the material better because they're releasing dopamine. They think they're helping people, right? By teach Teachers are naturally out there to, as helpers. And so their dopamine is flying through their brains and that's how they can memorize it. Uh, John Medina, he's a neurobiologist. He calls dopamine the post-it note of memory. So if you have dopamine, right? If, if people don't have cortisol, but if they have dopamine flying around, everybody's learning. Everybody's good to go. And the environment that you spoke of before, what would be important to create in order to enhance the environment? Yeah, I call it a, a compositive, a compassionate, positive environment. It's 
Um, I'm just going to give you two examples, you know, two basic stories of, of what I mean. One is not a composite uh, environment. It's I was um, initially went to Catholic schools, and uh, I had nuns who, if you got the wrong answer, would hit you with rulers on your knuckles. And I was deathly afraid of school. And literally, that's what happened. It happened to me in ge geography. And so the whites of my knuckles would show. They would hit you until you started, you know, you went through bleeding, and then you literally got down to the white of the knuckles. And so I was deathly afraid. I was basically a C student in that school. And my parents moved, moved out to uh, another state. And I went into a classroom that was very different. It was a teacher who actually took the time, listened to her students, and understood how they saw a problem. And so I'll never forget, she got down on one knee, and she asked me how I saw the lines, you know, the geography lines, latitude and longitude. And I was, no teacher have ever asked me how I saw it. And then she asked me, and I said, I see him up and down and across, and I'll never forget her. Mrs. Virginia Peck was her name. And she created a composite classroom because not only did she ask me how I understood, but she took the time to then use the way I saw the problem. And she said this, she goes, your O in down is the O in longitude. Your A in across is the A in latitude. And to this day at home, I have maps and globes all over my house because one teacher created a classroom environment that made it fun to learn. But this is also really important, Yvonne, but okay to fail because through that failure, she helped me learn how to become a better learner. She taught me a trick, right? To use the A in across, the A in latitude. And I started using that immediately. And then those compassionate, positive teachers showed me how I could learn for myself. And that is what I'm talking about. Not about punishing. Not if you get the wrong answer. Punishing only leads to cortisol, which we can't learn. So that's what I mean about setting a compositive classroom environment. So when we look at community, we take it from the school classroom into the school community and beyond. What is it in that environment that we all need to join together with to help create the action of what is needed to help everyone be successful? Yes, that's a great question, Yvonne. I, compassion is the short answer. Um, and I help cities, towns, schools, universities become cities, towns, schools, universities of compassion. And the reason I believe that's important, because if you listen and you pay attention to Luca, imagine if we all listen to learn to each other. Imagine if Democrats and Republicans actually listen to learn. Imagine if our town halls in Connecticut here, we still have town form of government where citizens come and participate in the town politics. And it's become so divisive. Uh, that I actually, for example, I, 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 I'm not either party because I believe both parties have forgot to what it's like to be an American. An American is something of a process. It has never an end. It's this idea of constantly growing. And some on both parties have forgot to listen to learn from other Americans. And I just wish, in, I wish that we could stop and listen and respect each other more. And if we had compassion for each other, I think that would lead to more constructive dialogues and more constructive policies. So actually becoming towns of compassion and putting compassion first, I think that would change the action of a lot of people that consider themselves adults who don't act adult-like uh, when it comes to our policies and it comes to our everyday politics in life. I, I think we need to sometimes hold a mirror to ourselves and say, would we be proud of our kids if they acted the way we act and not pay attention and not listen to all sides? And by, by the way, it's not just Democrat or Republican. There are many different ways of approaching a problem. And because we become so tunneled in two ways, we've actually excluded many different possible solutions that would blend Republican and, idea, and Democratic ideas together in unique and innovative and creative ways. But because we have planted our flag so divisively, we're actually weakening our own communities. And I, I, I think if we had more compassion for each other, we'd actually be helping each other and building better communities, stronger, healthier societies. 
And there's been studies. Uh, I think UNH, University of New Hampshire, was one of them. And there's, there's another uh, University of Texas, I believe. Uh, no, I, might, I, I believe it's Texas A&M. But anyway, one of the Texas schools, too, did a similar study about towns. The more towns had picket fences, the weaker their communities were because the more divisive they were. This is really interesting. The more sidewalks, the more people were interacting with each other and the more compassion they got to understand, to know each other. So basic, simple things that we can do to help our interaction and understanding are literally physically right in front of us. But if we just took the time, it'd be cool. Chris, if we were to summarize, what is the most important information that you would like people to know? That science, neuroscience, has shown us that compassion is strength. Strength in the individual, strength in the community, and strength in any organization. We have now neuroscience proof of that. And so when someone is being compassionate, it's never a weakness. You're never a doormat. You're actually building not only yourself, but your community, your organization, and your society. And what is the action that people can take now in their homes, in their schools, in their communities to begin the process of engaging in compassion using your Lucas guidelines? Yeah, well, that, that is one, one step, right, is to, to use Luca, listen, understand, connect, and act, but also start a process of becoming a town of compassion, a city of compassion, schools of compassion. And I think if we did that, oh my gosh. How do we every, begin? How do we do it? <laughs> we do, we can go to Charter for Compassion. Charter for Compassion International. Um, you can go look it up on the web, on the Google, and it'll get you started. I'm also, I sit on their advisory board as well. And so that, is it information that people can just download and begin to yes. apply on their own and do? Yes. And you can call me uh, at Western Connecticut State University. I'd be more than happy to, to connect with you that way. But yes, you can connect to the Charter for Compassion and everything's there. And also for schools. For schools, there's a program that I helped write and I'm still a big part of. And that's a Jesse Lewis Choose Love movement program. That program is near and dear to my heart. It's like ingrained in my DNA. And, and what I, is it doing? What is it doing to help within the schools? Oh my gosh, it's creating compassion, but it's also, as it's doing it, it's creating this amazing sense of community in schools that students are helping students. But you know what's even, that by itself is worth it, but Yvonne, scores are going up as a byproduct, not for the purpose of it, but as a byproduct of students helping students. So when parents are interested in going to schools where they want increased scores, how about increased scores and increased helpfulness and compassion? I'll take both, it's not either or. I agree with you and I thank you so much for the time that you've taken to be on this show. We greatly appreciate it and you keep up the excellent work that you're doing and thank you for everything. Thanks, Yvonne.